Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new week. Uh, hope you all are doing well. Uh, let's just begin this class with a word of prayer. Uh, so could one of us please lead us in prayer? Uh, Mr. Manohar, uh, can you please lead us in prayer? Yeah. Holy Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us about the revivals and visitations. Lord, how you work in the past. Lord, by the learning of this, the passion for the revival will be ignited in us, Father. Lord, grant us a desire to have the same kind of revival, even in this time, in our place, and in our countries, and to see that it is fulfilled in this time, in our place, and in our countries. This morning, bless all of us, bless the Pastor Lord, fill with the Holy Wisdom to teach rightfully. Lord, every one of us may receive what is taught with the open heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mr. Manohar. All right. Uh, so before we get into a class, let's just look at what we did last week, uh, just to remind ourselves. Uh, just a minute. Okay. Uh, so we looked at chapter six last week. We looked at how uh, we need restoration of the church, restoration in four aspects in particular. We looked at one, uh, restoration and understanding spiritual truth, how uh, it's important to, you know, uh, even as we listen to the word of God, as we listen to different kinds of teachings around us, uh, be sure to uh, test the word of God, right? Uh, meaning to test whatever is being spoken. Is it in line with the word of God? Understanding of spiritual truths, very important. Two, restoration of in, uh, in the wineskin to contain new wines in the sense that God is doing something new, right? So if God is doing something new, we need to be ready for the new. Right. Uh, so the example here was the wineskin and the wine. Uh, if you have an old wineskin and you're putting new wine into it, the entire wine is going to get uh, spoiled and it's going to just waste away. So it is important when God is moving or he's doing something new in our midst to be ready as new wineskins. Uh, you know, we looked at last week how we may need to come out of our comfort zones, right? So if God is doing something, we can't say, hey, no, I this is how I've been doing it for the past 10 years. So we will continue it this way. No, if God is moving in a different way, he's pouring out something new among us, let us be ready uh, to receive it the, uh, with a new wineskin. Then we also looked at restoration and God's people pursuing God's purposes, right? So, uh, you know, sometimes when we look at ministry, it looks like we are, you know, not everyone, but a uh, uh, lot of times it looks like we are, you know, building our own kingdoms, our, our own empires, our own uh, strategies, our own, you know, uh, uh, ministries is the focus than the understanding of, you know, we are building God's kingdom. Right. So we need restoration in that way. Even we looked at the fivefold ministry and how God has assigned the fivefold ministry within the church to work together. Right. And not to be separate. OK, like, you know, I'm an evangelist or I'm a pastor and uh, we are separate. No, uh, the, we, as 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 a church, we need restoration in the way we think uh, and the way we you know pursue God's purposes for our lives and even for the church as a whole. Then we looked at restoration in the church uh, uh, to impact the world, uh, like how we did in Acts, the early church. And then again, all through the revivals, we saw that the church was impacting societies, it was impacting the nation and the nations. And so we want to see that as well happening here. So uh, we'll pick up from chapter seven. Uh, before we start, uh, anyone has any questions, any thoughts? Uh, you would like to share any, uh, you know, anything that has come to your mind and you'd like to share it or you want to ask a question about revivals, uh, please feel free to go and uh, you, know, you can ask the question or you can share. Any questions? Okay. All right. So shall we move on? Chapter seven? All right. 
Uh, everyone okay? Is it is it too much? Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay, sir. All right. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Let's let's go to chapter seven. Now, before I start with chapter seven, um, I'm sure I, I just wanted to update each one of us that the uh, assignment has been posted on the stream and the classwork tab. Now, this assignment is for 50 marks, right? And then at the final November end, you'll have another 50 marks exam. So uh, both those, both the marks will be consolidated for 100, uh, 100 marks as your total. Uh, so the assignment has been posted. It's an open book exam. <clears throat> it's more of uh, practical answers. Now, uh, it's basically, uh, you know, uh, when you look at the questions, it's basically what you learned. And so you can write what whatever you learned. So, um, Please do look at it, just a few questions. And also, please post that, uh, your assignments, upload it on, uh, either you can complete it on a PPT or a Word document, and you can just upload it in the classwork tab. So the instructions are mentioned on the question paper as well. So uh, do take time to uh, you know go through the questions and uh, also fill them up as well. All right, let's go to chapter seven, revival in our days. You know, when we when we hear the term revival, it 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 is so common nowadays, right? Uh, when we look at different ministries and different meetings, we see we we see them, right? Uh, uh, revival meetings, or uh, you know, uh, revival pastor or revival prophet is coming. It's wonderful, <clears throat> but let's see what is true revival in our days acts chapter 2 verse 17 to 18 this is a common verse and it shall come to pass in the last days says god that i will pour out my spirit on all flesh your sons and daughters shall prophesy your young men shall see visions your old men shall dream dreams and on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. Right now, the writer here is mentioning about the last days. He's talking about more of the latter latter reign, and Peter is talking about Joel, but he's also talking about what is going to come further on after. That is right now the latter reign, and so God promised us that he will pour out his spirit on a larger scale on all flesh, right? So all flesh, the latter rain is going to fall on all flesh. Now, the reason why a latter rain is important is because a la latter rain uh, comes, uh, uh, when, when it comes, it helps in gathering the harvest, right? So for example, you know, we've all been doing ministry. We've been ministering to people. Maybe we are ministering to people who are, uh, uh, you know, from other faiths. And we don't see, uh, you know, their hearts being changed. We don't see them accepting Christ. That's all right. What is happening is we are sowing the seed. But when the latter rain comes, there will be a time of harvest. Right? So it's not necessary that, okay, um, you know, we sow the seed, only we will see the fruit of it. And sometimes we are just sowing the seed. But when the latter rain comes, maybe through somebody who's very insignificant, God may use that person to bring revival in our nation. And then we'll see these seeds that has been sown will be ready for harvest. And so that is why uh, I believe that it's very important that all of us as believers uh, you know, uh, have this lifestyle of sharing the gospel with people. Just put the seed in their heart, right? Uh, now, they may not understand it, or sometimes they may not even, uh, you know, they may just neglect it. They may reject you. Uh, that's all right. I remember, there'll come a latter rain. God will pour out his spirit, and these seeds will come forth in harvest. Right. So even as we see we are closer to the coming of the Lord, um, we can expect a greater season of harvest, which means a greater harvest of souls. Right. So now is our time. 
uh, if we are expecting the latter rain, we can sow the seeds now. And then years later, we will see the harvest of souls. We will see because the latter rain is going to come. Right uh, now, when we look at the book of Revelations, um, Revelations talks about those two witnesses, right? And it mentions about how they will go about preaching the gospel and touching many lives, and thousands and thousands of people will come to Christ through these two witnesses. Now, that is also an example of the latter rain, right? Uh, now, we don't have to wait for, for that time. We can begin now, right? James chapter 5, 7 and 8, I'll read that. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So James is writing here and he's saying, be patient, right? For, uh, you know, for how the farmer waits for the fruit. Even we, when we sow the seed, you know, you don't, we don't see a farmer saying, okay, I'll sow the seed. And then the next morning he gets up, okay, I wish, you know, there's, there's the fruit has come or the labor, what I've done yesterday has come. Now, we know that he himself knows that it's not going to happen in one day. It's, it's going to take time. He's got to look after it. He's got to water it. He's got to, he's got to protect it, nourish it, uh, do everything that he has to do to uh, make sure that the, the fruit is uh, good. And so, uh, so it's very important that we understand that when we sow, we also need to be patient. Now, you know, in this seasons that we're living in, everything is so instant, right? Uh, there was a time when you had to, you know, if you had to do some bank work, you got to go to the bank, you stand in the line. Now you don't, you don't really need to do all of that. Everything is done online. Things have become convenient, uh, right? And so sometimes we may lose patience. But here's what God says. James is writing, he's saying, you be patient, establish your hearts. That means be, st be steady. Let your hearts be ready for what is ahead, right? So God has promised. So I want to encourage each one of us, right? We may not see the fruit of the seeds that we have sown in people's heart, but there will come a time when the latter rain comes those seeds will be ready for harvest, right? So let's look at the need for revival, right? With all the technologies and tools and methodologies available for us today, it's wonderful, right? We are able to have the online classes, Bible college. Uh, it's good. It's easy. It it's, it's helps us all to grow together as well. But sometimes with all of these tools and availabilities and methodologies and technology, we may forget that it's not only about this, but it's about pressing into God for revival. Right? We need to press in for God. So why do we need revival? There are plenty of uh, answers for that, but let's look at a few points here. Right? Firstly, we need to be convinced that we need a revival. Right? And I believe that uh, for our nation of India and also the other nations, uh, Africa too, uh, there's a great need for revival. There are so seeds that have been sown over hundreds of years, right? And so when the latter rain comes, let there be a powerful revival that will touch many lives. So let's look at why we need this revival, especially at the times that we're living in now. First one, I'm on page 81. First one, to ignite our passion for God, for his word, and for his spirit. Right? Uh, you know, uh, conventions, meetings, tools, methods, all this is good. Right? Now, you know, the we have the app, Bible apps. We have online uh, services, online messages. It's all wonderful. 
right now all of that is good but we as believers need to ignite our passion for god for the word of god for the things of god and not rely only on tools and methodologies right yeah they are there that's good so for example we've been you know listening to a preacher maybe for you know six months and we we are learning in the word and uh, it's, it's wonderful but if it's only that then we forget that hey we need to press on for something more we need to ignite ourselves for the word of god for the passion of god for the work of the holy spirit in our lives right john chapter 6 and verse 63 it is the spirit who gives life the flesh profits nothing it is the spirit that gives life i'm reminded of this in the book of corinthians paul writes to the corinthians and he says this to the church in corinth to the Corinth. he says hey you all are flowing in the gifts of the spirit you all are anointed you all are doing wonderful things there's prophecy there's word of knowledge there's gifts of healing the working of miracles wonderful there's no other church like the uh, like the Corinthian church that is flowing in the gifts of the spirit yet he says something to them he says there will come a time that God will test our work with fire and then he explains there he says there's wood there's hay there's gold there's silver and God will test each of our works with the fire right now what happens to gold when you put fire to it, it purifies what happens to silver it purifies it just gets better uh, what happens to wood what happens to hay when you put fire to it? it just becomes ashes and so what is Paul trying to say if we are doing our ministry you know wood hay look, may look big but when you burn it it just becomes ashes so it's not about how big but it's about how we are doing ministry whether it is of the spirit whether it is of the flesh if it is of the spirit it will be like gold and silver when tested by fire but if it's of the flesh it's going to burn away and become ashes right so we need to make sure that even as we are pressing on for a more passion for god as we're pressing on for the word for the work of the holy spirit in our lives we need to ensure that we're doing nothing out of the flesh but only out of the Holy Spirit. Second one, to we need revival to move from glory to glory and to be the kind of people that God intended for us. You know, the one of the most characteristic thing of a revival is revival takes us to new realms in God. If we look at the book of Acts, we see we saw the revival there. Then later on, even uh, in the first awakening, uh, and the uh, second great awakening, we saw how the revival moved people from this level to another level. All of a sudden, there was a heightened, exp uh, you know, experience of God. If picture this, you, you know, we studied about this, right? The second great awakening, the third great awakening. The church was able to impact the world in the sense that. You know, people, the moral conditions of the land was changed because of revival. People shut down. Pubs were shut down. Right? Prisons were shut down. The police officers didn't know what to do. There's no work. There's no crime. Now, that is, that is, that, that is what God's presence, just moving in a heightened power. Right? from glory to glory from strength to strength and god begins to release that among his people so here's the thing we should not be satisfied with where we are right uh the best thing to do as students uh, we all are students as we study the word of god as children of god is to never come to a place where we feel okay i know everything Right. It's okay, even if we don't know. But here's the thing. We press on for God and say, God, I want to know. I want to study. I want to read. I want to 
improve. I want to develop. I want to grow from strength to strength. I want to grow from glory to glory. I want to be able to impact people. I want to be able to teach and preach the word and the anointing, the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? Here's the thing. God responds to hunger. Like he responds to hunger. When we are hungry, God will respond to it. Remember um, uh, in the Old Testament, uh, uh, Jacob wrestles with God. What does he say? He says to God, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Jacob knew what he did. I'm sure the whole time, you know, in his whole life, he kept thinking, you know, I did something wrong. You know, I shouldn't have done this. Maybe he lived with that feeling all his life. But here he got a chance. And here he's, uh, you know, uh, he's wrestling with God. And he says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. God responded to that hunger. Right? And so we as believers need to be hungry for God. We, we need to, you know, move from glory to glory, from strength to strength. Right, uh, with all the tools, with all the methodologies, with everything that's available for us, we can grow from strength to strength. Third point, to see, we need revival because we want to see the gathering of the harvest. Like we were saying, during the revival period, <clears throat> sorry, many people are saved. Many people are added into the kingdom of God. And this is in large numbers. Right? Remember, we saw the... Uh, the layman's revival, what started with six people praying together, went on to touch 15,000, 20,000 people all across the world, meeting together at 12 o'clock, just praying, and we saw revival. And we saw many people coming back to Christ, many people saved through this prayer movement. And we also looked at, you know, I'm just giving you a few examples. Uh, uh, William Joseph Seymour at the Azusa Street Revival, he started off in an old burnt building with about 15 people, went on to become 20,000 odd people every day church services. Right? The reason we want to see a revival is also for the gathering of the harvest. So that whatever, you know, uh, now if we have regular campaigns, regular programs, regular meetings, it's not good. It's very unlikely that you'll see ten thousands and thousands of people coming into the Lord. Right? So, for example, we have like a pastors' meeting in a certain place. We are planning this to teach the pastors. It's very unlikely that we will see, you know, uh, hundred thousand pastors coming, and you know, it's very unlikely. But when there is a revival, it's something that has never happened before. You will see thousands of people coming. Uh, so the move of God, the revival is needed so that there will be a huge harvesting of the souls that were, you know, that seeds were sown in people's lives, right? Fourth one, we need revival because we want to see the church truly impacting the world as salt and light and bringing transformation, right? When we looked, as I just mentioned, Revivals impacted societies, communities, people. The social, moral, and spiritual transformation happened not only within the church, but also outside of the church. Genuine revival will cause a transformation in society. I'm reminded of this. This happened many years ago. I think it was 2011 or 12. Let me get the year wrong, but... Um, there was this famous preacher from the West who was uh, planning to come to India and do like a three-day campaign. Uh, and so they put up borders, uh, hoardings and all of these things, banners everywhere uh, saying revival meeting, revival is going to pour out, uh, great many souls uh, are going to be touched and all of that. So it was wonderful. Now, after the, after the whole meeting, it was a three-day meeting, thousands of people came. Now, after the whole meeting, there was an article written saying that there was a massive outpouring of God. Many lives were touched and 
uh, thousands of people have been uh, blessed by uh, this whole meeting. So it was wonderful. But another Christian, another writer, he wrote about the outcomes of that meeting. And I'm not, I'm not going to name the people, uh, but here's what he wrote. He said that 95% of the people who came for that conference were Christians. Right? Christians from different churches, they came for this conference. Now, he's a famous preacher from the West. So 95% of them were Christians. And the other 5% were probably unbelievers, people from other faiths. And what happened was they only saw that after this whole meeting, everything just went back to normal. Right? People went back to their churches. And they didn't. See, the survey also said that there was no increase in attendance in the churches. But they hyped it up so much, saying that okay, this is a revival. God has poured out His. Here's the thing: when you know, when God is pouring out His Spirit, it's not going to be something which, uh, you know, which is temporary. Something that is, you know, in the sense that. You know, God moves, and then there are uh, a revival. It's not going to be like you know, just hundred, two hundred people. It's going to be thousands of people. Right now, what I'm trying to, why I gave you that example was, there was no transformation in the society, but they, you know, named the whole thing as a great revival meeting. Of course, many of them would have been blessed to the word of God, maybe through the worship, all of that, but ninety-five percent of them were Christians, and there was no really much transformation in the society everything else was just normal and so when a revival comes we will see the society being impacted right there will be a change we may think how is that going to happen especially in nations like india or africa where there's so much of sin around this is what revival will do. Revival will, the move of God, the Holy Spirit will bring conviction upon people for the harvest of souls. Right? So sometimes we don't have to do anything. When you look at, uh, example, William J. Seymour and all these wonderful revivalists, they didn't do anything. They just prayed. They came there. They preached the word of God. But they saw the harvest of souls. Right? So... <clears throat> The presence of God overflows from the midst of people within the church into the communities. Now, that's why I'm, uh, you know, we don't say anything, but we're a little weary of these revival meetings. Uh, you see these banners saying revival meetings. It's good, we have, you know, we want to do all of this, but it's not going to happen just in one or two programs or one or two events. We're going to talk about few hindrances to revivals you know if we want to see revival it's going to there needs to be dedication there needs to be sacrifice right and god begins to bring transformation let's look at a few hindrances to revival now uh the last revival we saw in our nation is the shillong revival uh and then after that, there's no really, I uh, wouldn't say a revival, but uh, there was no move of God in such a way that, uh, I'm talking about our nation of India, but across the world as well, I don't really see uh, like a revival, like how it happened in the early, uh, early church. But let's look at why, why is this so? Right, uh, you know, has God changed his mind? Has God decided, okay, uh, only three revivals is enough? Uh, let's stop at three now. Let's see what are some of the hindrances of revival. First one, ignorance. Right now, if we do not know what is what God has in store for us in the church, we are not going to expect it. Right. Uh, we're not going to be asking for it, right? So, for example, if 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 we don't know what we have as believers, what God is giving us as believers in Christ, as we are His children, if we don't know it, we will not ask for it, right? If we don't know that healing is for us, God wants to heal us, 
God can deliver us, if we don't know it, then we're not going to ask for it. We're going to say, okay, God, thank you. I've, I've managed with this, uh, you know, uh, this sickness or, uh, or this uh, pain or this trouble I'm going through. I'll manage with it. Now, that is nothing but ignorance, right? Uh, if we don't know what God has in store for, the, for us in the future in terms of revival, we will just find ourselves, you know, fighting the move of God uh, uh, out of ignorance. Right? So first thing, we as a church need to understand and equip ourselves and say, hey, God has moved like this in the past. God can move the same way or God can move in a different way. So we should come out of that, uh, you know, ignorance. We should educate and learn us, learn from the word of God, understand the word of God as well and teach it to other people. Two, misunderstanding. Now, when we studied about church history and we studied about all the revivals and we saw an outpouring of God, sometimes you may understand, okay, this is how God will move, right? Uh, we may feel that, okay, we just have to do a couple of meetings, maybe 10 meetings, and on the last day, there will be a revival, right? Not so. So sometimes we fr frame our own picture of who God is and what he does, right? Our own mind frames it, and we're saying, okay, maybe God is like this, and maybe God will work like this, because last time he did it, so this time he may do the same way. No. We need to be open, right? We need to, that's why it's important to look back at church history, to see how God works, but to also be open to what he's doing in the now. The book of Acts itself, we see that, uh, you know, uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit resulted in what God desired for the church. One sermon from Peter, thousands were added into the church, right? Now, now, for example, we may think, okay, if that's happened before, why can't it happen now? Why can't we go and preach a sermon and thousands of people uh, come into the, the you know, uh, accept Jesus Christ? Now, we must understand that that was the birthing of the church. God was doing something um, new there. That was just one event. We don't see that happening later on, right? But here's the thing. If we misunderstand these scriptures, we may lose interest or we may lose the whole uh, understanding of how God works. Third hindrance to revival. I think this is the most important hindrance. And we as a church need to battle this. Sin and worldliness. When sin and worldliness creeps into the church, it becomes a hindrance for the move of God. When we take a casual approach to God, or we are compromising in our lives, we do not show interest. And sometimes we feel that, you know, uh, okay, I'm satisfied as uh, uh, as a believer. I'm satisfied uh, with what I know. We come into that kind of attitude, then, um, you know, sin and worldliness creeps into our lives and also into the church. And where there is sin and worldliness, the Holy Spirit power will be dampened, right? James 4.4 4 says this, uh, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So we cannot live in sin and worldliness and then expect God to move in power. Yes, there is God's grace. There's God's mercy. Uh, God is a merciful God. He forgives our sin. But as a church community, we cannot continue to live in sin and worldliness and expect God to move, uh, you know, to do a great revival among us. So let me give you this example. For example, there's a, there's, as a church, you know, there is, they are, they're praying for revival, right? It's been 10 years they're praying for revival. But within the church, there's jealousy, there's pride, or there are people who are fighting with each other, or there's immorality, maybe even just one or two of them. Uh, now, if the church is living in that condition, 
how can we expect god you know god will still work miracles he will still do his you know what he has to do that is god's promise right but we cannot expect god to pour out his spirit in a greater measure when we are living in sin and worldliness so as a church we must strive i'm not saying that we are the best church but what i'm saying is we must strive to pursue godliness to pursue the things of god to cut away uh, that's why we started this semester by laying the axe to the root so you cut off the things of the flesh you cut off the things of this world sin and and all the things that the enemy brings you cut it off at its root so that it does not grow within the church right and there are plenty plenty of examples where we see uh in the, not only in the early church but even now where you know the the enemy has infiltrated within the church worldliness sin people living in continual sin has caused a uh, dampening of the move of the holy spirit so we need to ensure this and right? if we are praying for revival let's first check our lives say god these are things that i need to get rid of these are things that uh, have been bothering me help me to overcome right and when we cleanse ourselves we begin to pray and ask god for revival god hears the prayer of those who are hungry fourth one one of the hindrances for revival is complacency sometimes we are complacent of, about spiritual things right we are satisfied with what we are uh we are satisfied in the place that we are here i know the old testament i know the new testament i'm not saying we are saying that but i'm just giving you an example right so if we become complacent hey i know i know i know about how to preach i know how to share the word i know how to lead the worship and so we kind of you know become complacent and we should avoid that we should avoid being complacent right god responds to hunger and god responds to those who are thirsty and desperate for more of him all through from the book of acts to now you look at these people these revivalists they were desperate and they were hungry for god they were never complacent remember um oh, forget that uh, evangelist uh, I think it was Charles Spurgeon that we studied on. He was praying five hours a day, and then God told him, "If you want to do, if you, if you want to see revival, he moved it up to seven hours a day." Right. So now, what I'm trying to say is, you know, we we may not be able to pray five hours and seven hours a day because we've got work and family and things to do, uh, but we can come to a place of being constantly hungry for the Word, constantly hungry for God. You know, we may be doing something uh, in our home, or we may be just uh, doing our work. Uh, can constantly be hungry for more of God, constantly praying, constantly seeking, asking God, communing with the Holy Spirit, constantly having this desire to know more of God. One of the things that I desire, and I keep constantly doing and praying, is. you know i may be looking after my kids or maybe working or doing something i keep telling myself in my spirit god tell me something new from your word teach me something new from your word remind me holy spirit remind me of the things that you have you know you know as a, as a pastor we have preached hundreds of sermons uh, you know uh, and so sermon may just be a sermon we may forget it but I, i you know one of the things i do is i say god remind me of those sermons that were preached that have blessed me to be a blessing to help me to grow in that and so the holy spirit reminds us right so we don't come into a place of complacency right five lethargy another big hindrance for revival is lethargy lethargy is simply spiritual laziness right we don't make the effort to pray we don't want to press in we don't want to pursue god and whatever you know experience we have we are satisfied with it remember to experience more of the presence of god requires a greater measure of pressing in a greater measure of 
pursuit a greater measure of intensity in what we do right uh, I remember even as the, the church uh, we came here in, in Mangalore and uh, we were about 10 people when we started and you know the, you know Mangalore is a different kind of a city everything is you know uh, very laid-back city it's a wonderful city very laid-back uh, but we saw that there was some kind of a spiritual lethargy so I be we began to pray uh, as a family. We began to, you know, really pursue after God. I said, God, if you have to move in this church, right, we have to do something. So we began to pursue God. We, we remember in our family prayers, uh, we used to pray every day about an hour, uh, just a family prayer. Then we pushed it. We, okay, let's pray more. Let's seek God more. At times we would spend about two hours just just reading the word praying seeking god praying in tongues now there were challenges our children were there kids were there just you know causing a lot of disturbance uh but we are not to use that as a you know uh, uh as, a, as a hindrance or an excuse to press in for god we need to press in for more of god we need to press in and ask god with greater intensity god this is what i want I, uh, if there's spiritual lethargy, we need to get it out of us, right? Uh, yeah, you know, sometimes I speak to a lot of people in church and, you know, a couple of days back, I was speaking to a young man and he was saying, I just cannot pray. I cannot wake up in the morning. I wake up at 10 a.m. and I start my day. My day starts at about 11.30. And so I asked him, how old are you? He said, I'm... I'm 27, 26, 27 years old. He starts his day at 11.30. And he says, uh, and then he says, oh, I've got so many problems. I'm not able to pay my fees. I'm not able to do this. I'm not... I said, so are you praying about it? He said, yeah, I'm praying. How long are you praying about it? He said, five minutes. I said, that's wonderful. It's good that you're praying. But five minutes is not going to you know, help. And, and I told him this. I said, we, if we need something, we need to intensify, make an effort to pray, to pursue God, to press in. Remember, he said, I asked him, how, how come you didn't come to church? And he said, oh, uh, it was 10.30, so it was really difficult for me. Uh, I said, why, what happened? No, 10.30 is early. So I said, you, when you go to your hometown, you book a flight at 6 a.m., and he began to smile. He said, if you get a flight at 6 a.m., what time do you get up? He said, 4.30. What time you should be in the airport? 5 o'clock. So you got one hour before for a flight to, to your home. If you're taking a flight to your home, you will reach one hour before. Even if it's 4 a.m. flight, you will reach there at 3 a.m. You will make sure you are there. Why? you paid for it and you need to get it you need to get into that flight to go to the destination that you want to go to the same way if you say 10 30 is church you can be here at 10. so he was like oh no that is different but i understood what i what i was trying to bring across to him was we can do it but lethargy stops us from doing it right so we need to come out of this uh, spiritual complacency or spiritual laziness. Sixth one, indifference. Indifference within the church. Right? Or I really don't care about revival. Or there's no uh, desire to touch people's lives. Right? There's no desire to uh, reach out to cities, reach out to communities. You know, there's one group of people who are saying, hey, let's do evangelism. Let's go reach out to people. Then this other group is saying, hey, no, let's just... Uh, let's just leave it, you know. Uh, let's just pray and other things God will look after. So you have this indifference within the church. That becomes a big problem, right? Uh, it, it's like divisions within the church. And what happens when there's division within the church? God cannot move. You, we will have our regular healings and miracles every Sunday, but then we want to see a move of God. Uh, we should come into unity with one another. Right, uh, Revelation chapter three, verse 
16 to 17. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And do you not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked? So here he's just trying to bring up a point saying that, hey, we cannot be lukewarm. Even in our, uh, we, you know, these differences are there, but we need to come together in unity. And we looked at it in the old, uh, in, in the early church as well. Unity is a precursor for revival. Prayer is a precursor for revival. So where there's indifference, right, there's no focused vision, right? Seventh point, uh, one of the hindrance for revival is resistance to change. Revival can be disruptive, right? It changes our whole workflow, right? Uh, it, it can upset our plans of programs and strategies. Remember the revival we spoke about in the Welsh revival? By the time the preacher goes up and stands, already everyone is, you know, mourning and weeping and crying and some are rejoicing in the Lord and mixed emotions. Even before the singers would come and sing, they would sing one song. There's already an outpouring of God. The move of God is so powerful. Right? So what if during that time they said, no, 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 we have to sing three songs, then the word, then we do this, then we do that. If the programs and the strategies or the plans, thought out plans was, uh, you know, the main focus, they would have lost out on the whole move of God. But they realized that, okay, this is God moving. It's okay if they sing only one song. This is God moving. It's okay if the word has not yet been preached, but God is bringing conviction on people. Right? When we are resisting to change, we, we may not see. It becomes a hindrance for revival. Eighth one, busyness. Sometimes we are too busy to pursue and spend time with God. I, I believe that busyness is one of the most practical tool that the enemy uses to stop us from bringing, closer, bringing us closer to God, right? Not only for revival, but even for our personal lives, right? He keeps us busy, right? He keeps us busy. Oh, I'm busy with this, I'm busy with that. Now, it's important that we all work, right? We may be working through the day, seven hours, eight hours a day we're working, but there are times of sacrifice where we can say, okay, I'm going to spend this time in prayer, reading of the word of God, spending time in God's presence, right? So it's very important that we understand that, you know, we all are busy, right? All of us are busy, uh, but we can make time, right? Uh, you know, one of the things that we personally do is, you know, we got two small children, right? So the whole day they are busy, you know, uh, doing things. So we get very little time in the word. So what we do is once they go to sleep, the first thing we do is we, you know, go to our word, go to the word or just listen to some nice sermons or uh, prepare some sermons. Uh, just spend time in God's presence. Sometimes we just uh, worship the Lord with a few songs uh, because that's our time. Right? Other times we're busy, right? Uh, the children are always around. Uh, so other times we're busy. So we can't help it. But then there are times, you know, sometimes when they sleep, when at nights we wake up, we spend time in prayer. Uh, and, and it's a sacrifice. But here's the thing. We are saying, God, even in our busyness, even in our, you know, in our busy schedules, we want to make time for you because without you, all this busyness and all the things that we have that keep us busy makes is, is doesn't make any sense. It will not be a blessing to us. So don't let the enemy bring busyness as a tool to stop you from pursuing God. You can make time. I can make time. We all can make time intentionally to pursue God. That's the last point and we'll close. Devices, uh, the, another reason for uh, a hindrance for revival is divisiveness, which is divisions. We hold grudges 
uh, among our fellow ministers, unforgiveness, bitterness, denominations, you know, superstardom, superhero kind of attitude uh, that divide us, right? Uh, and within the local congregation, again, there's strife, there's discord, there's contention. Remember, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. He's saying there's division among you. One is saying, I believe in Paul. One is saying, Apollos. And now, uh, still the Holy Spirit is there. But the move of God has dampened their spirits. Right? Their spirits are dampened to understand that God is willing to move in a greater way. Uh, so uh, that this can be a great hindrance. Divisiveness, which means divisions denominational barriers and superstar hero kind of statuses that people carry. Okay, I'm the greatest prophet, you are under me, and all those kind of attitudes. We need to break it down. So these nine points are just a few points on hindrances of revival. We'll stop here. We'll pick up from tomorrow. Uh, you, does anyone have any thoughts, any questions? I know we passed our time. Yes, yeah, Shri Kumar, uh, yeah, thank quickly. You, Pastor. Pastor, I want to know two things. The difference between uh, yes. indifference and division. As you said, one thing, like indifference. One more yeah. Thing. yeah. Okay. And one more thing, I just want to note that um, is any season for the revival, like, uh, or um, like as you are sharing these things, is it uh, when we um, when we overcome these these things? So we anytime we can uh, br bring that revival if we focus on these things and if we correct ourselves and maintain, um, or is any re any season for the revival? I just want to know two things. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Shri Kumar. I'll just quickly answer your question, Pastor. Time. First one. Um, this div device division and indifference is like, for example, you like to pray, I like to pray. So that's good, but indifference is is something that you're saying no hey let's pray for this but i'm saying no let's let's do something else let's do events for this that is indifference i have nothing against prayer but at the moment we have different opinions right so that's indifference uh division is is different you know difference in thoughts and attitudes right it's causing now just because you are saying pray and i'm saying let's do outreach doesn't mean we are uh divided Right. We have different opinions, but we have the same idea of, you know, reaching out to people. Uh, but division is something that is, you know, you are that and I am this. You are doing this work. I'm doing this work. And it's it's something that's, you know, two separate things. Uh, and that's what division is. Uh, so uh, I hope that answers your question. The second yeah. one. Is Yes, the second answer is, is Shri Kumar. Uh, yes, there are seasons of revival. We started off this lesson by saying that latter rain is going to come, right? So, God, you know, all these hindrances that we studied, it doesn't mean that a small church we have to come, you know, we have to uh, come overcome all of this. The church as a whole needs to overcome these things, and God will pour out. There's, you know, it could be a season. Uh, especially now that we are in the latter days, it could be a season. It could be God can use any kind of ministry as well to bring about that, uh, you know, uh, revival. So uh, we don't know when, we don't know how, but we know that God can. So uh, I'll just leave you with that, Shri Kamal. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'm sorry to take five minutes extra. Uh, have a great week ahead. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow as well. God bless you. God bless. Thank you. Thank you.